For our purposes, chapter 18 is going to be a relatively brief one in which I go over a few things that you have probably already seen uh, if you've uh, begun the last week's lab sections. Um, and also it covers some information that we've already discussed in previous chapters, but there are some points I'd like to make here and rehash a few things. Uh, this chapter on genomics and bioinformatics focuses primarily on the technologies that have been developed within the past few decades that have enabled us as humans to better understand our genetic basis, uh, the genetic basis of everything, uh, not only for our own phenotypic traits, but also the interaction among genetic elements, the interaction among species and their genomes. Uh, we'll get up to that last in this chapter, but then also helping to understand the evolution of other species. Uh, here you can see an image of a DNA sequence alignment. This is something that you will be doing in the lab this week if you have not already done it. But what this is showing is two sequences, two DNA strands that are lined up to one another. And what I want you to recognize is that in this context, we are not looking at a double-stranded DNA molecule and these lines indicate hydrogen bonds. What we are seeing is the comparison of two sequences, probably from two different species. Let's say we're comparing a dog and a bear. The blue might be the dog, the red being the bear. And you'll see that for this region of the genome that they both share, so they both have this uh, homologous region or uh, same gene, let's say. And for most of the nucleotides within this region of the genome, the dog and the bear have the exact same sequence. But there are some areas where there is not a line connecting the letters, the blue and the red, where they have allelic differences. They have different nucleotides due to the process of mutation since their common ancestor. So a few things I want you to be familiar with uh, that relate to our exploration of genetic information and our laboratory techniques that we use. Um, the first is the utility of restriction enzymes. And we spoke about this quite a bit uh, in the past when we've talked about how you can uh, use bacteria for cloning. Uh, that was in the previous chapter that we've seen. But here, I just want you to understand that uh, quite frequently when we are using modern technology to sequence DNA, we are dealing with very large chromosomes, uh, much like your own. And these chromosomes are so long that we, we need to break them down into bite-sized pieces. Those bite-sized pieces can be sequenced. And then we take all of those individual sequences that we have and put them together into a complete uh, picture of what your genome represents. It's almost like a puzzle. You can imagine maybe you've been stuck at home during uh, some period of time. Uh, you're stuck at home right now, not in my genetics class. And perhaps you've undertaken the hobby of puzzles, right? You dump a bunch of pieces out on the table and you've got to figure out how they go together. This is how genomes are broken into bite-sized pieces is by using restriction enzymes like the three indicated here, EcoR1, BAMH1, uh, although BAMH1, are, those two are the same. So two different enzymes, and you can see how it might cut a specific region of the genome, and in this area, yield four different chunks. Now what we do is we chop up the DNA with these restriction enzymes into different chunks, much like little puzzle pieces. Sometimes, the BAMH1 or the ECOR1 may not cut every single site where it is uh, intended to cut. And so you might end up with lots of fragments that are illustrated in the second bit to the left of the uh, word contigs, where you have a chunk that is, is only fragment one, a chunk that's one and two together, a chunk that's four, a chunk that's three, and a chunk that's two, three, and four together. What you're seeing in the bottom is how we put all these puzzle pieces together. We have to look for commonalities, much as you would when putting together a puzzle. Uh, those are visual commonalities that allow you to integrate different pieces with one another. Here, what we're looking for is overlapping regions that allow us to establish similarity 
And when we line up these, uh, for example, region twos, it puts region one in context with region three, the position of those things. And if you take that overall, that holistic picture of assembling all of these fragments that have been sequenced after the genome was chopped into pieces with restriction enzymes, you can see how we can come back and reconstruct the order of all of these elements on the chromosome if we are able to use these overlapping matches in order to assemble them together. These fragments um, are aligned with one another because they have overlapping regions that are identical. So um, the way in which we generate this sequence data, actually read the G's, A's, T's, and C's of a genome has changed quite dramatically even since I began graduate school in the late 90s. Um, at that point, I could sequence a small number of nucleotides each day, and that was right around the time of the first human genome being sequenced. And that first human genome took approximately a decade and cost hundreds of millions of dollars to sequence. Because of the advances in sequencing technology, we can now sequence a human genome in a day for less than a thousand dollars and that price is coming down constantly and what these sequencers look like they're not much larger than a large desktop computer uh, you can see one of them here we've got a few of these at the university of mississippi and these read very small bits of the genome at a time maybe 75 bases at a time but they can read hundreds and hundreds of millions of those each day at the same time or reading them simultaneously. Now there are a lot of videos that we could watch that show you how this technology works, but because of the rapid advances, there are so many different types of technologies that are being used at present and the field is advancing so rapidly, it's not necessarily worth it for me to teach you one specific example. Um, if we think about creating these hundreds of millions of fragmented sequences of a chromosome, as I illustrated on that second slide after the restriction enzyme, you have all of these little different chunks. And what I'm showing you here is zooming in where those little chunks overlap, allow us to put all of these, say 75 base pair fragments in sequence end to end to end this is enabled by the matching overlap, and we are able to create a consensus sequence between these. Okay? Here we are lining up identical regions from the same genome from the same individual. Now you're going to do something similar in the labs this week where you are aligning sequences from different individuals to look at how similar they are and use that information to determine how these organisms are related to one another. Um, but this is simply how we use genomics to assemble large read sequence libraries. Now, bioinformatics is a term that uh, is self-explanatory, but it's, it's also come into use quite frequently, right? This was not a field when your parents were in college. So what bioinformatics is, is it's a field that deals with the enormous amount of biological data, generally that's primarily DNA sequence data, that are being generated by these new technologies. And this has necessitated the, the build out of enormous computer server clusters, um, lots of mathematical and computational analyses to deal with these enormous numbers of sequence reads. Just think of the logistics of taking the 400 million fragmented reads that are 75 bases long from just one run of one of those sequencers and putting all of those 400 million pieces together. That is not something someone's going to do by hand or by eye. We have to have computer software that can run those analyses for us. So as our capabilities have grown in the world of generating DNA sequence data, so too has the demand for bioinformaticians and the need for the products that they produce, namely 
uh, software and analytical techniques that allow us to analyze these large data sets in uh, short periods of time. Okay, So we can use bioinformatic methods to compare sequences among different species, compare um, gene regions and mutations among individuals, we can look for uh, relationships among species. That's one of the things that you'll be doing in the lab this week. And much like that first uh, slide that we started out with, and you will see exact examples like this in your lab this week, when we analyze sequence data, we have a lot of resources that enable us to make comparisons from which we can test uh, hypotheses of similarity or identity or patterns of heredity. Okay, So here's an example where a query sequence, the top one, the one that we have, we have generated in the lab, we submit it for comparison, and it comes back with a hit, a relatively solid match, here a 93% match, so these two sequences are 93% identical, and this subject 174891 is a sequence read that is in a publicly available database and so there's probably information associated with that sequence read that I can use to understand uh, the data that I've generated in my query sequence. Okay, So these types of comparisons are very useful in biological research. So here's an example where we compare a gene in humans to a homologous gene in mice these genes have different names, they have slightly different products, and they do slightly different things, but we can see that they are so similar that one is likely that they are derived from a common gene in the history of uh, mammalian diversification. But you'll notice that there are some nucleotide substitutions that have happened where humans and mice have different nucleotides. There's also been a region where either humans have had a codon deleted, we have three nucleotides missing, or there's been an insertion of a codon to mice. We don't really know what, which is the way it went unless we compare to other mammals and also the sister group to mammals, so earlier lineages that are uh, closely related to mammals. Okay, So these types of comparisons of genetic information are very powerful for understanding the history of life on Earth. And one of the most fascinating applications of our genomic abilities is not the simple things that are, you know, doing genetic testing to identify whether you are predisposed for a certain condition, or forensic testing, or even tracking the evolution of, say, the coronavirus. Some of the things that have really captured the imagination of the public in these applications of bioinformatic methods and genomic methods are the ability for us to peer into the past and explore questions that we simply don't have any other way of exploring. Um, and this is exemplified by one, uh, the field of Stone Age genomics, in which DNA that's recovered from extinct organisms or ancient humans of historical significance allow us to really explore some of this prehistory that we don't have a great record of. Um, a relatively recent example of this is exploring the, the genome of King Tut, so one of the most famous uh, rulers of Egypt in the past, and by exploring the genome of the mummy of King Tut, there's quite a few, good bit of information that we have learned about this individual that was not recorded in history. So you'll see from that previous slide that he had malaria, he was frail, and so let's dig into some of the things that we were able to tease out from exploring the genetics of this boy king. And so the first thing is they weren't really sure who he was related to or who his mother was. And using DNA samples from him and his uh, family members, they created a family tree. So just as we can do paternity tests now, you can do the same thing uh, with mummies or ancient samples. And they determined that 
let's see, that Akhenaten was King Tut's father. Um, King Tut's mother, they identified her body. They still don't know what her name is, but they determined that she was the daughter of Amenhotep, so uh, she's actually the full sister of her husband, Akhenaten, which is also quite wild. So all of these types of things, the fact that he had been infected with malaria, the fact that his uh, mother was also his aunt um, is quite remarkable. We've also been able to get sequence data from ancient animals, extinct animals, and extinct hominids. So we've spoken a bit about uh, Neanderthal DNA, uh, and you're going to be analyzing some Neanderthal DNA sequences in lab this week. But we've also been able to extract DNA from extinct species that have captured the imagination of uh, children since long before I was a child. Uh, for example, a woolly mammoth. So researchers have been able to extract from bones, subfossil bones of woolly mammoths, perhaps, the, you know, for example, those frozen in the Arctic tundra, they can extract DNA that's been preserved in those bones, sequence it, and compare the DNA from those to living elephants. And here's just an illustration of an, a mitochondrial genome, right? Remember, mitochondria are circular. They live in those maternally inherited organelles. And as you know, as you all remember, mitochondria have all their own distinct genes. And in extracting data from these preserved bones of mammoths, they were able to sequence little tiny pieces of the mitochondria DNA that have been saved in these fossils. And so each of these little black stretches represents an individual sequence from the mitochondria of a woolly mammoth. And what you will notice here is that there are lots of little black bars they overlap a great deal, and that overlap is necessary for putting together the complete picture. You can see down at the, let's say, 7 o'clock position, there's kind of a gap where they, the researchers were not able to get any good sequence from. Uh, but for the most part, they were able to get sequences that cover almost the entirety of the mammoth mitochondrion, and they're able to compare this DNA to the DNA of living elephants. And we're able to demonstrate that the mammoth is actually most closely related to the Indian elephant, which is a different species from the African elephants, the forest and the savanna. Okay. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on Neanderthal DNA. Again, you're working on it in lab. It's something I've mentioned before that we are able to sequence DNA from this species. But using these comparisons of how different is Neanderthal DNA from my DNA? How different is Neanderthal DNA from chimpanzee DNA? And knowing that mutations are random and accumulate over time, the more mutations you have, the more time has passed since two lineages split. By making the comparison between human and Neanderthal DNA, researchers have been able to conclude that the actual split between the populations of humans and Neanderthals, their genetic isolation, happened roughly 370,000 years ago. Although this, time, this split began as far back as 700,000 years ago. Okay. Now, this comparison of genomes is not only fascinating in examples like those Stone Age genomic examples that I've given you, but comparative genomics is also incredibly useful and important in better understanding our own biology and physiology and developing mechanisms of treating diseases, of understanding the evolution and mutational basis of various maladies that affect humans. So this comparative genomics refers specifically to the comparison of genomes of different species, okay? And when we study genes that are involved in human diseases, most of these genes that cause things like cystic fibrosis or dwarfism or any of these 
mutations that affect humans, most of these genes are found and used in other species that are much easier and more ethical to study than humans. Um, even a fruit fly has roughly 60% of the genes that you have. And so studying how those mutations to those genes affect the biology and physiology of fruit flies can be helpful in understanding the biology of disease within humans. Dogs have nearly 75% identity with the genes that you have. So they have a slightly smaller genome, they have many more chromosomes, but they have about the same number of genes that we have, and 75% of those do the same thing, are the same genes. Okay, They're not 100% identical, but those differences matter in studying those differences and also studying how mutations to genes that cause diseases affect dogs and how we might treat those is helpful for human health. So systems like dogs are great for study because they have some a lot of the similar issues that we want to treat with humans. They have epilepsy, OCD, genetic cancers, blindness, deafness. A lot of these genetically caused maladies occur in dogs just as they do in humans. And so most of these inherited dog diseases are similar or identical to something in humans. Okay, So the, um, the reason that we have miniature dogs like these chihuahuas is because there's a mutation in this IGF-1 gene that affects growth rate and deposition of bone in these dogs. And this gene serves the same role in our own bodies. Now, like I said, this is going to be a relatively brief chapter. The last thing I want to touch on is something that we've spoken about previously, and that is the microbiome. Our ability to sequence enormous amounts or enormous quantities of DNA in very short time periods for uh, very small cost has enabled us to better explore and characterize the bacteria and viruses and yeasts, all of these microorganisms that live in and on our bodies. I've already told you that they're wherever you are right now, whatever chair you're sitting in, there are more non-human cells than human cells, and that's a good thing, okay? M many of these things are there to perform a certain role. Your body has evolved, humans have evolved to live with these specific microorganisms, and when those uh, communities get thrown off balance or perturbed for any reason, whether it's your diet, whether it's the lotion that you use or the sunscreen or whatever it is, that can really affect the health of you, okay? And so these sequencing technologies have allowed us to rapidly sample microbial and bacterial communities on humans and explore the role these communities, these, this microbiome plays in a number of different diseases. The Human Microbiome Project explores this in great depth. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of articles being published every year on things from the effect of maternal diet on the infant gut microbiome to the role of the microbiome in HIV immunosuppression. Right? So many of these things that we deal with today are now uh, being recognized as the result of a imbalanced microbiome. And so that's why you're seeing not only people taking probiotics these days, which is basically something like yogurt that has a lot of bacteria, good bacteria in it. We are also seeing prebiotics. Okay, Prebiotics are things, like supplements that are intended to feed or provide a, a good environment for the bacteria that you want in your stomach, right? So if you are eating Dodo's pizza every single day, seven days a week, every meal, that's probably not a good balanced environment in your intestinal tract, and you might negatively alter the microbial community in your stomach. But taking a prebiotic, let's say, could help to reestablish a proper balance there. That's not to pick on Dodo's Pizza, nor is it to suggest that you should run out and start taking prebiotics because these are things that are yet to be well regulated um, within the US. And so their efficacy uh, is not necessarily 
Okay, so that's it. This is a brief chapter uh, and we'll leave it at that.